Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now speaking with Elizabeth Barron. Hello. Hello, it's so great to be here, Alan. Thanks for coming on to our yeah, show. Yeah, for sure. We really appreciate it. We're very excited to talk to Elizabeth. She has 31 years at Ford. She is immersive visionary champion of the world. <laughs> love I love it. I'm very excited <laughs> to talk to you about this. Her newest company, Immersionary, is fresh, 2019 yes, started. Yes. And we'll be talking about that and the importance of this 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 3D storytelling, the user experience of that, and the uh, the awareness expansions that we can get from that, and the purpose of it. All this good stuff. Before we get there, Elizabeth, teach us about your journey. How did you get to where you are today? How did you even get excited about engineering software? Yeah, isn't it crazy? So I started my journey really with a natural love of the physical world. So I loved optics, light, like the, the way light travels, photography, all that good stuff. And I also loved math. And so I just, so I got a degree in math, computer science, and believe it or not, got a job at Ford Motor Company which you wouldn't think having a computer science degree, I'd work at an automotive, but I started writing CAD code. And because I loved geometry and all that good stuff, it led me into that world. So all my time at Ford, I never really worked on a car. <laughs> I was always working on tech, tech that supported the people that were yeah. developing those cool vehicles. And so I, I worked in this, um, paradigm for like lots of years writing CAD code and then migrated into more of like the the process and how uh, you would use the the tech and then started looking at the whole entire vehicle like chunking it together and working with the team of people to develop some ways of making all the digital data make sense yes. to visualize yes. and then from there I started thinking about virtual reality and how cool it is. Yeah, take us take us through some of the the first uh, times for you of doing the, the getting excited about optics, getting excited about math, getting excited about writing CAD codes, seeing all the data that comes from that, making it applicable in the design and engineering process. Tell us about how all of that works. Because most of us get into vehicles, we've completely forgotten yeah. about the, the last hundred years that has went into the slow but sure process of making the vehicles more effective, more more safe with right. seat belts, all these Absolutely. fun oops moments yeah. along the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there is a lot that goes into making a vehicle. A lot of analytics, a lot of thought about the the, the art, the the beautiful curves of sur uh, surfaces on the exterior. There's a lot that goes into your experience as a customer like how are you going to enjoy being in cabin and what are you going to do and so the cool thing about uh, vr and then ar the whole immersive paradigm is we can represent all of that together and so there really isn't a, a medium that i know of that represents all of that stuff puts it in context and then puts you as the customer at the heart of how you see all this data so there's analytics for you know structures uh, like mechanical things there's packaging things like zones for like the way those parts move around and you have to make sure you have clearance and then there's all kinds of stuff about found findability ergo reachability all that kind of stuff and it's all together in this immersive environment but back in the day when i first started doing virtual reality at ford <laughs> it wasn't really ready for prime time so we could have 60,000 polygons in our entire scene. <laughs> what, what does that explain that to so us? So that is basically hardly any data. <laughs> oh, so, oh, sure, sure. Right, right. So like, Oh, in a whole scene. In a whole scene, yeah, yeah, 60,000 okay. polygons. So okay, just to, okay, to gotcha. frame that in like today's... Like pixels, kind of. A, uh, well, like a uh, little... But in a 3D right. environment, yep. so yeah. So okay. they're like... Uh, uh, triangles that yeah, 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 yeah. like okay. tri strips and or, you know um, a mesh so a, a mesh, mesh that contains yes. okay. 60,000 shapes yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing that's uh, crazy about that is uh, now we have uh, millions oh yeah 
tens of millions, like wow. 80 million. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, so the, the difference is, is stark. And the uh, tech, when I first started working on it, was really not ready for prime time. But I, I could see the potential yeah. in what it had to offer. And I'm always very thankful that Ford let me do it. Even though, you know, when you think about what I would do to you is I would say, okay, Alan, I'm going to strap all this stuff on your body and from head to toe, oh, back here, over here, give me this, let me feel that. And, and it was very physically invasive to get you in that environment back in the day. And now you can literally 30 seconds get immersed in mm -hmm. a scene and explore an entire vehicle and look at it in context and... It's it's totally great. <laughs> yeah, I love how you speak about the the how the exponential technology curve um, affected the the, the sixty thousand polygons to m tens of millions of them because the resolution, the amount of data that you get from that yeah. is just so much greater, and your ability to actually have your awareness expanded to new ways of thinking from that higher resolution because we're such visual exactly yeah, yeah, creatures. So. So then take us through like when you're, you know, when you're first starting and when even at the middle and towards this end of this, you know, of the journey with, with Ford and with these, with the immersive experiences, what were the, some of these most important use cases? Because it seems like it can be yeah. used for anywhere from, you know, the actual uh, ma manufacturing and to be able to have uh, employees be able to visually see how they're assembling vehicles, mm -hmm. but all the way to, like you were saying, the customer. The customer right. is able to see themselves in the vehicle where they're going to, what was the word you used for how they interact with the vehicle? Yeah, the, just the, the ergo or ergo, not, yeah, yeah, the ergonomics, ergo, and, the ergonomics yep. and, mm -hmm. and how quickly they yeah. can identify how to do certain things right, in the vehicle. Right. Yeah. So that's a big question. So basically the way um, I approached bringing immersive tech to Ford was case by case. And what would happen at the beginning is I would find uh, a, a case that somebody needed to solve. So they needed to know like the, the um, findability and reachability of um, radio controls for a vehicle. And so I'd say, I can set that up for you and you can come and look at it. And so then we would tackle that, and then that would be a use case that people would say, okay, that's good, I understand. In the beginning, they would say, that was very useful, but I really don't wanna do that again because you're really violating my space, putting all this stuff on me. But as technology marched on, we were able to go, you know, in, in a move the tech so that it was less obtrusive and less uh, like violating your personal space and then just more value. So between the less feeling like a cyborg and then more <laughs> content in it. But we already to, are, yeah, Elizabeth, we're exactly. already cyborgs. Exactly, and, and so really. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, the good thing was is that as that progression happened, we were able to take the tech from these singular use cases and start blending them. So then you could do ergo studies along with design because there could be a, a instance and there very often is that a design is really beautiful but it's not functional yeah. Yeah. so how do you uh, have each of those people the artists and the user experience person and the engineer that designs the underlying components how do you get them all together mm -hmm. so that they all understand each other's perspective mm -hmm. through immersion it is a great way of getting people mm. together when they don't normally understand each other's perspective. Because an engineer comes in with a spreadsheet mm -hmm. and then an artist comes in with a, a drawing or an animation of mm -hmm. you know a model. And then an ergonomics person comes in with anthropometry data on people mm -hmm. and reach zones. Mm -hmm. And their, their language <laughs> that they normally speak is all different. Yeah, yeah. But through immersion, you get in, you look around, you see in context and you understand. So the, the um, answer to your question was like we started attacking case by case and then ended up uh, with blending multiple functions together in an immersive environment and then you could really understand each other's perspective. So the real value mm. of the tech mm. is as a communication sure. tool. Yeah. I, I like to say for people that have unlike minds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
so then how would the the the, the tool of immersion immersion experiences be able to help the artist ergo ergonomist yeah and ergonomist, ergonomist <laughs> and the engineer communicate so they all are seeing the same thing which is the vehicle which is the thing that the customer takes delivery of and that makes sense to everybody so no matter what your perspective is you, the final result of your work is the vehicle and, you know in the yes. case of ford right yes. and so they all understand what that would look like they they intimately are familiar with the final product and so if you represent all of that data properly in context, put it together, then it makes sense to everybody that's in the room and, and more. And the, the thing also about the tech is you can loop in people from other locations and have them see through your eyes and then understand your context for them somewhere around the globe. And so then, the one of the main one of the main ways of of, of of the importance of taking these unlike minds and bringing them together is that when they're uh, so this is pre final product, they're in mm -hmm. the process of deciding where some of these functionalities go, that type of stuff. That they're able to all be in this immersionary experience together, where they're looking at like a simulation of the final product, right? and then determining where it needs to go for optimal functionality. Exactly, exactly. They can determine where it can go and then they can cheat the natural world. So I, I love that about the tech is that, so, okay, I'm, I'm looking at this vehicle and it looks good, but what happens at night? What does it look like? Does it still look good? Oh, if yeah. I put like mercury vapor lights versus, you know, a, a fluorescent light model on it, what does that do to the color? How, how does that, you know, uh, play with reflections? Yeah. If I am in a cloudy day situation versus a bright light situation, what does that do? If, yeah. if it's different times of year and the sun's in different locations. So there's all kinds of lighting things you can do. And like you think about the reflections on your side glass of your like instrument cluster on the glass you can simulate all of those things in real time and get all this data that you really couldn't get unless you literally were at that time at that yeah, you know yeah. and th those weather conditions existed totally. or yeah. that's good you know, stuff yeah so and yeah. then think about that with options option a option b i mean the the ability to to like switch out geometry yeah, switch yeah. out where you are what you're seeing you know what uh types of analytics um, change the the display so that instead of looking at the beautiful um, um, sheet metal you're looking at um, lines that show the the surface continuity so now you're getting analytics then you go back to what it looks like then you switch paint colors then you switch yeah, time yeah. of day you know Cheating you can the see. natural world yep. is the way you mm -hmm. describe it which is very interesting that you can really quickly make these iterations um in the design without even needing to and you can also test the functionality as so of what it looks like when it's at night so you're seeing the function how functional is it still exactly. at night with a certain this is this is cool what, is this are immersion experiences also used in both the the very early training process of someone in the manufacturing at Ford? Is it also used for them to better understand how the vehicle is being assembled? Is it used at the end of the process for the customer to be able to immerse themselves, obviously physically in the vehicle, but also virtually, potentially, in all in the ways that they can use all the components of of the car? Yep, yeah. absolutely. Okay. So what's cool is you can actually get immersed in a sketch, something you, a 2D sketch. Just surround yourself with it, wrap it on a sphere and get in it and look around and then start volumetrically understanding your flat sketch really early before you've actually even created geometry. You can do that and then use that paradigm all the way through the whole process. So like very early on when you're ideating and creating like volumes and spaces and thinking about like uh, the ways in which people might interact in your vehicle space, that it's just a perfect way 
to kind of lay out the, the shapes and, and form around the occupants of the vehicle. Yeah. And with so much going on with autonomous vehicles, there's a lot more use cases. We might be in a situation where, like we are right now, looking at each other and sitting on mm -hmm. something that looks like a nice sofa like this, but taking a ride. Yeah. So how do we interact in that environment, mm -hmm. which is different than the occupants all facing forward, you Correct. know? Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, goodness yeah. in trying to understand really early on how That's those right. things are going to go. And then... The four chairs pointed towards each exactly, other. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then movable. movable. Maybe they move like this and maybe they go like this way and, yeah, you know... Yeah, yeah. To like, your left is the Museum of Natural <laughs> History. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's, and then what do you do with all of the space around you, the, the surfaces? Can they now have more than one function? Uh, can they have some smarts in them? Or, you know, like, I don't know what yeah. they're thinking of, but there's a lot of possibility for how the surfaces in the interior of the vehicle get, get used now. So there's yeah for computers right or yeah, displays, the, displays or you know all kinds of stuff and yeah, yeah. and and then also if you think about so that's really really early on when you're ideating and trying to understand mm -hmm. what uh, what potentially you might want to develop and then carry that through bed mode yeah exactly <laughs> yeah hit the button and uh, recline give myself a massage yeah. you know that <laughs> sounds good <laughs> just spray some lavender yeah, uh, exactly. some relaxing yeah. jazz yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, fast forward that through to the end of the process for like vehicles that are closer to being produced and then we can this is i just think this is amazing uh, we could take the whole manufacturing process from beginning to end and uh, come out with the tolerances, the build conditions for every part to every other part in the vehicle. And we could take that, read it in, and show it to you without any pre-work done to the immersive environment. And then, sh and then you could pick any components and then we could show you with you know the Six Sigma capability how capable the manufacturing process would be for the vehicle that you're looking at. And what is the Six Sigma capability? So, so um, most, so every car company, I'm sure, uh, designs their products around um, this um, way of determining like how accurate you are. So a Sigma, uh, like oh. three Sigma and six Sigma, it's like a- Away a, from a the way, mean. Right, right. Okay. And so it's, it's basically like how capable are you? So six Sigma is- Like the most capable. The most capable in the process. It's performing the absolute best right. that you possibly right. could. Right, yeah, right. Okay. And so, you okay, know, okay. and so you want to get to Six Sigma capability. That way the so, vehicle's making it like 100,000 miles and the right. safety ratings are off the charts. Right, and the, and the tolerances, like the build quality between the components is tight and where it should be. So it's as designed, not as produced. So are they the same? Are they different? You know, yeah. it, it's that kind of thing. So we, you want to be very capable in your manufacturing process and you want it to look really good. So yes, if you yes. could take all of that data and, and you can actually watch like one component to another move yeah, yeah. and then they might move this way, they might move flush, mm -hmm. like up mm -hmm. and down, they might move back and forth, mm -hmm. but you can actually take any components like dumped all that data in, apply it to the model, and then and then pick things and watch them move and understand how capable your manufacturing process is. That is really cool because it applies every like the whole manufacturing process going through, and and like this get, attaches to this, attaches to this, and as that happens, there's locators. Yeah, there are yeah, other yeah. things that. Uh, determine there's uh, jigs and fixtures that measure where you're at. All of that is considered. In the end, you get this spreadsheet that tells you how capable you are. But we can take that spreadsheet and apply it to the geometry and show it to you in an immersive environment. So you see mm. literally what the customer would take delivery of, not what was designed. 
and at the peak capability of the vehicle is what or not or right not. if so you if can have you, a learning experience yes yeah. well what if you uh run that analysis and you find that you're not optimum mm -hmm. now what do you do so now you have a chance to react because yes. Yes. you haven't produced the vehicle that's yet right. That's right. you have only predicted what will be but the the thing about the tech the, about the immersive space is it may something that is uh, the highest tolerance may or may not look good mm -hmm. so because yeah. we're there are uh, you know lighting like tricks with lighting shadows something might be hidden in shadow and never be a problem but in the past we, it might have been flagged as a problem because it didn't meet the tolerance band that we thought but it actually it's okay and then other things may meet the tolerance guidelines and be spot on and then you look at it and it looks off compared to the other things that are around yeah so then there's a functionality and uh, aesthetic that is hopefully an optimal but there are sometimes trade-offs and right. these need to be analyzed and exactly interesting now okay what were some of the other because th this slowly led you into wanting to start immersionary your own mm -hmm. company what were some of these other really aha moments for you that you were like okay we i really need to take my skills and start yeah. applying it around the world and helping people around the world with this process yeah. so a couple things one is the value of collaboration in immersive environments uh, the insight that you get when you're together with other people and studying the thing that you're producing is unlike any other way of understanding and communicating. And the value of all of the work that I did when I was at Ford with a team of really great people, by the way, nobody does anything by themselves. Definitely. Um, but the, the value of that and the reason why I was able to get uh, the company to invest in it was about collaboration. It was about how people work together, how they share, how they can be in the same location around the world. Yeah. So you could be in Germany and I could be in Australia and we could be in the same immersive environment yeah. at the same time. That's really powerful. Location agnosticism. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. So, so that's one thing. Another thing is um, I develop most of the um, immersive tech and without being able to see it <laughs> so I was stereo blind and so I couldn't see in 3d so I was in this 3d immersive space and developing it and part of the reason why I got into this tech was I knew I was stereo blind and I studied like what does that mean why can't I see what everyone else can see and what's different about what I see compared to everybody else. Yeah. And um, I really enjoyed providing immersive experiences for people and having them react even though I couldn't see it. So when somebody would get in and say, this is so cool, oh my gosh, I would, I would know that I was onto something. Yeah. Um, but in 20- What would you see? I would see, uh, it's like if you took um, your iPad yeah. and you walked around the world. That's what I saw. So kind of like flat, but dimensional because it, you could move through it. So like a TV, but you know, you're directing it yourself. So just a, a flat, so like you would have um, no dimension to you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But, but if I turn and I look sure. at you, it'd just be like having the iPad and yeah, yeah. turning and looking. But is it, are, 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 like, is it really locked in that way? Like, for 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 all of your sight? Oh yeah, everything because um, my eyes were in different planes, and so to form a stereoscopic image, your eyes are—I mean—they're separated for a reason. Mm -hmm. They converge on a point, and then your brain determines how far away how that is. Yeah. And and but mine were like this, so I could never converge on a point. So I had to use this eye or that eye, but I couldn't use them together because they, they literally were Different physically planes. incapable of coming together to converge ever on anything. Interesting. And so in, 
Are there advantages to this as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there's any advantage. It's I was it, waiting it, it for gave you to me say headaches. It, it was now. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay. It gave me headaches. It was um, I had to concentrate really hard on like where my eyes were so that they didn't appear weird to people. So I had spent a lot of time like, you know, moving my eyes to a acceptable place. But I had surgery in twenty uh, 11 and 2012 mm. that gave me stereo. Whoa. Yeah. That, thank goodness for science. Exactly. Wow. And that is why I wear glasses now because it, so basically the surgery was taking my eyeballs out of my head. <laughs> actually? <laughs> the actual eyeballs, like sucking them out and oh then my disconnecting them, like keeping the optic nerve, nerve of course, but yeah. uh, like uh, just disconnecting them, moving my eye and then sewing it back together and then putting it back in my head. What? And so what uh, a yeah, crazy isn't that crazy? Surgery. And so um it ha people have it yeah. you know, it's very rare um when like 2 to 3% of the population have it at birth and that was me. Um people acquire it through aging. That's and still quite a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. So it, it, they people are out there, they they can't see stereo and you know, but I what had, was the moment for you when you could <sighs> find, when you w woke up after the surgery and you were like, "This is crazy." It was instant. It was instant. And so what I did before the surgery, my my doctor was like, "You know, Elizabeth, you're you're pretty old. <laughs> I'm not sure we can teach you this old dog a new trick. You know, you might we might do the surgery and you might still have monovision." I'm like, "Well, that's okay. Let's um, can we?" try uh, yeah. so he what he did was he gave me these glasses that were like thick prisms and they took my eyes and they adjusted oh, sure. so that I could yeah. form a stereo yeah. image and I went into my car and I looked uh, at the Ford logo and my steering wheel like popped out at me yeah and I just burst into tears yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I'm like oh my gosh and I'm calling my husband like yeah. oh, He's yeah, like, yeah. take some time, calm down, don't drive. <laughs> but it was yeah, yeah. it was awesome. But having that experience taught me uh, the value of immersion in a way deeper sense than yeah. I ever understood. And what it taught me was that aesthetics matter and little um, lights and shadows matter. Yeah. And it is part, I, I see, um, because I didn't have it for so long and then I had it, once I had it, I got back into the immersive environments and they didn't look right. Where before oh. they actually looked Whoa. better. Whoa. And I'm like, what, you know, what, why do I think it's not as good? And it was all of the, the detail that I was now getting Oh, about the lights. The way light and, moves yeah, in yeah, stereo yeah. and the way it emanates. And, and so it led me to do real-time ray tracing and develop that concept and, and getting in an immersive environment and then, you know, being able to slightly move your head and then see how light is playing. Because those, sometimes those are illusions, but those illusions are part of our reality. Yeah and, yeah. and so between the There's collab, so much yeah. sh shading right now that's happening on your face. Exactly. And it's very important. Right. And it's nuanced. It's very beautiful that we've taken this long period of evolution to be able to see that nuance and all facial expression, yep. all lights and shadow effects. And this is a crucial for immersion experience. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And but yet they're usually absent. And just until recently um, the ray tracing is kind of coming into its own, but back in uh, 2014, I was just like determined to make it happen. And so we, at, at Ford, they, that was another investment thing, and they, they invested in some tech, and we were able to do real-time ray tracing in 4K. Whoa. And so that was an industry first, and it, it just showed the power of what it really should look like. And so uh, your question, why, you know, why did I feel I needed to go out on my own? I think that the time is now to develop standards for how we work, how we realize uh, like cross-functional 
collaborative communication in immersive environments. And yeah. I think that the, the technology has come into its own and with innovations and um, AI, using AI for uh, ray tracing, like doing what's called denoising, which mm. means like kind of getting rid of the uh, clutter in the environment mm -hmm. and kind of making some assumptions about what the images should look like. That is really, yeah. really cool tech. And so it's taking it from um, large scale supercomputers and making it more useful. And then in enterprise, that's, that's what they do. They communicate, they talk, they share, they, they make something. And then if you make something, then you really want to see it before you make it and then see it properly as the customer would see it before they take delivery of it. These, this, your, your push for, for these new standards <coughs> in immersion experiences is really cool to be able to now unpack with you. What are some of the, the standards? You're talking about location agnosticism so people from around the world can collaborate in the same immersive environment. What does the, the version control look like? What does the engineer, how do engineering simulations make their way into these environments? Yeah. How does that actually turn into you know final products and data, AI, cloud, all these types of things that are involved in this process? Mm -hmm. What does what are, what would your ideal standards for immersive environments? So look like? the immersive environments, specifically for enterprise, yes, really uh, require discipline. And the 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 thing about immersive tech is you might see a really cool demo, but it's a one off. And so is it part of how the enterprise works? Well, maybe, maybe not, but mm -hmm. is a really good uh, application of immersive tech works how the enterprise functions. It works with how they produce their data. It works with how they, uh, like their milestones and how they do their process, like for the development of their tech. It works with the, the multitudes of data that they produce. So some is analytics, so like CAE, computer aided engineering work, like uh, stress and load and weight, uh, cost information, like all of this other ancillary data that's different than the CAD data that is produced to engineer the parts. There's a lot of data. Yes. And if it all, is they, they, every enterprise knows their process really well. They have this well-oiled machine to get to the final product. But where a, a good um, implementation of immersion takes that data and lays a foundation and then feeds the immersive environment at different points in the process so that you're working how the enterprise works and you're not retrofitting the VR tech to the process. So mm -hmm. in other words, mm -hmm. if you start breaking that chain, yeah. it adds time, it adds cost, yeah. and nobody wants to do it. So they might do it once, but they're not gonna do it all the time. So you really need to fit into how the enterprise functions and then provide them the capability to assess their data in the way that they are used to assessing it, not in the way that yeah, the yeah. software has, like whatever, choices that your rendering software has that's yeah. not good enough. It's, it, you don't want that. You want what they do. So what would be examples of the way that enterprises would want to use the immersionary experiences in, uh, with the way that they could continue to use the data in the way that they're used to? How would, how, what would these use cases look like for the new enterprises that you'll be working with? So uh, one would be really about manufacturing. So taking the manufacturing process, like I talked about earlier, and applying it to the design, and then showing what that those build conditions would look like. That's one. Another one okay. would be um, if, if you're uh, designing a product and you have to rely on somebody's, um, like somebody operating the, your product. Um, you need to know that the, the vision zones are good and that they can you know, under, reach the things that they need to. And that's analytical information mm -hmm. that is developed by s other softwares, 
but you would actually need to see the, the vision zones kind of come into your immersive environment to make sure that that is you can see and you can reach and you can understand. So that's more analytical information in that environment. You might have uh, quality data that represents um, like some um, potential damage that might happen. So you know every uh, every company wants to make sure that their quality is really high, that their products mm -hmm. stand up, mm -hmm. and then um, some of the things that are could be damaged you might never perceive, like a slight bending in a part. Mm. You know that so you could represent that in the immersive environment. So that's analytical information that actually morphs the geometry, mm. puts like a maybe a slight. Uh, bend or a dimple in something and then you can look at it and say I, I can't even see that I've ray traced it I've looked at it from up close and far away I've looked at it day and night and it looks fine so it's really getting all of this data from all of these different sources yes. into the model and then showing it as it would look if a customer yes, was interfacing with it Okay, so then this is like the the, immers the immersionary experiences are uh, at this entire process of the the product lifecycle management. Yep, there. Exactly. They come throughout the whole process, and then and then are are would you say that the what is now the cutting edge, and where is it going with the virtual reality or augmented mm -hmm. reality? How is Australia person and Germany person in the same environment doing all the things that you're listing? Through right. what tech? Yeah, through yeah. Uh, m mostly VR. So, and you know, wearing a headset, being in a virtual space, and then having uh, locations known of where you are in the environment. Mm -hmm. So, even though you're in Australia, we would know where you were with respect to this couch. Yes. And yes. I'm in Germany, and you know where I am with respect. And so, I would see your headset floating in space. Yes, yes. yes. And you would see mine, and we could collaborate. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the innovations in this space are really going to be uh, through storytelling and providing an actionable uh, way of you to experience the world. So we're, we're, we have now a lot of potential, if we do the hard work and we have a platform and a pipeline of getting a lot of the different uh, information into those models like we just talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's new is getting data in so that you can control your destiny mm. so you can have an experience with a product so if you're in a plane and you sit down in your seat and you're in you know you're um, blessed with first class mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. you can kind of recline your seat and uh, turn your display on and reach for this and that and all of the things around you are actionable so you can do them you mm. can interact with them the way you want to, not the way somebody told you to, or not in a way that is a one-off because you have this like game controller in your hand and you're like yeah. pressing this button and doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, okay. you just make things happen. And then you, yeah. so, so it's taking the physical world, putting it together with the virtual world, but the physical world is actually just a representation uh, in very mm -hmm. uh, like, um, minimal form of what you're studying and then but when you're in the immersed in it it appears to you that you are fully in the physical world and then you can start interacting so doing a lot with actionable haptics that are passive so that you can actually feel and touch and then kind of control your destiny tell a story yeah, yeah, yeah. really get at that use user experience and then that includes integration with like 3D printing, um, you know, like a smart 3D printed objects that actually have microcontrollers embedded in them. So they function in the virtual world and then do more with uh, like where you place those things and how they operate. Yeah. And then the other big thing I would say um, that's coming is really like training models in AI. Mm. So you're looking at things, and then while you're assessing your product, you're learning. Yeah. And then while you're assessing your product, somebody 
you know, somebody, the cloud, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, um, is in context presenting you with relevant information. Yeah, yeah. About, yeah. about how the functionality or about the aesthetic right. and <coughs> all these other types of data points that are really important and you're there with another person from another country looking at it and talking yep. about what you're learning about what you're designing and engineering even pre-manufacturing so you don't make oopses saving lots of money this exactly. way this is like this is kind of like the dollars and cents side of things that mm -hmm. companies that's why there's a lot of investment into the space because they know there's a lot of oopses that cost lots of money and yeah, so we exactly. can save on that. Yep. Interesting. I like the um, I like the idea of storytelling a lot. That that is one of the. It always takes me to this like big history perspective on civilization. A lot of a lot of I think of the roots of 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 the malevolences that happen is because we potentially did not do a good job at explaining you know how we birth from the cosmos and how it's <laughs> exactly. such a it's such a you know such a blissful uh, ecstatic experience that we yeah. get to even live yeah. on this earth together exactly. and so if we if we could uh, do our best to make these immersive experiences that give people's awareness from birth to understand that this is such a a, a whole uh, experience for all of us uh, including mother earth and all of its um, uh, biosphere that 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 is um, those these are the immersive experiences that that I'm also as well as all the manufacturing yeah, yeah. I know <laughs> I know, I know, I know design and engineering yeah yeah there's <laughs> like yeah there's some other really powerful immersive experiences that I'm very excited for as well um, Elizabeth any other thoughts that you think we may have missed that you think are important to to cover uh, so on the experience immersive experiences um, in the end we are all emotional creatures that use our mind's eye to figure out uh, what we see in our world so we we our brain stitches together images and makes things appear to us for our reality but our brains are always involved in what we see because our our visual acuity is actually like this two degree field of view and then our brain is putting together all the things we see so the reason why I bring that up is because our brains are involved in how we see the world, it is, that means that we have the capability for insight and we, even though we see things, uh, we may look at a spreadsheet and like look at data and think that's just data. When you see it applied, it's a different set of data. It's the same set of data, but it appears different to us because now it's in context and it, it has meaning and all of the things that go uh, with being part of a, you know, a, a person of earth here, <laughs> yeah. they all kind of come out. And that's what I think the value of immersion is. It allows you to see it in context, use your insight yeah. and, and really form, use your mind's eye and understand something completely and it gives you such a better connection to your end customer, whoever that is, yeah. that you wouldn't have in any other way. Yeah, yeah, that's yep. so so important. And the looking at it on a you know on a like a seventy year timeline, just going from such a a flat pixelated two D mm -hmm. surface to now yep. to now the full three D indistinguishable virtual realities that that and augmented realities that that is. That is so profoundly, um, it's, it's a too much different experience for our brains to engage yeah, with than exactly. what, 70 years ago. Right. Yeah, we were. Yeah, and there's so much promise coming with AR. I'm really excited for yeah. where that's going to. Yeah, I hope it has a lot of, of especially focus and potential on all of the retraining that, um, that we need for yeah. the uh, automation and AI robotics age. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, yes. There's so many jobs opening up that we need to retrain for these, these new jobs. Exactly. Yes, yes. Elizabeth, this has been such a pleasure. Yeah, thank an you honor. very You've much. You've been teaching oh. us so much. Thanks for coming <laughs> thank on to you, the show. Thank you, Alan. Oh, yeah. it's been a pleasure. I really yeah. appreciate you asking. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're really pushing forward some really important topics, and it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah. We greatly appreciate you. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you're thinking. Go and share these conversations about these immersionary experiences, the importance of them with your communities, with your friends, your families, on the internet. Go and share. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Support Kofez, support Elizabeth. All their links are <laughs> below. 
Also support simulation, our links are below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye.